right. So let's get into uh, the, the biggest thing we're looking forward to tonight is our guest uh, from Entropy Technology Design and the Nimbus 4 Severe Weather Detector. Uh, he's the Chief Technology Officer and actually uh, co-founder of, of the technology is uh, Edward Shaver. Edward, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> In fact, let me say I, I'm truly honored that I'm on the first podcast and I, I will I will volunteer right now to be like on podcast number ten thousand as a look back. So when <laughs> we, you get to will, like ten thousand, let me know. I, I want to be. <laughs> we'll love we will love to have you at that point. Um, so do do me a favor, Edward. For really for me and for everybody else, just give us a little bit of your history and how how you got into weather. A, a good question and. Uh, it was quite accidental. Um, my background is physics. Uh, I went to Penn State University. Um, in my early career, I did work for DOE. Uh, I was interested in working on renewable energies. I uh, did some work for on and uh, solar energy development. Uh, worked on the Barstow plant out in California. Um, had the interesting experience when Ronald Reagan was elected president. Um, he decided fossil fuels were great, and he zeroed out the budget for renewable energy development. And so I transferred my physics degree into uh, designing sonar systems that went on guided missile submarines. So I like to say I went from renewable energy to mass destruction in about two weeks, showing the flexibility of a physics degree. Nice. Um, and I was not involved in weather at all. Um, I got pulled into it quite by accident. There was an, an article in the Washington Post in 1989. Uh, and it talked about a little boy that was struck and killed by lightning standing at second base on a little league field. And the gist of the story was this was a tragedy act of God. If you're going to play baseball in the summertime, these things happen. And as a physicist, it occurred to me that was a bad answer. You know, the right answer was there was some way that there was a warning device or technology on that field. So the little boy wasn't standing. But he could be struck. And that just got me into looking at, at what was available and there wasn't anything in, in 1989 and 1990, basically, unless you were going to drag a portable weather station out there, you were just going to wait for the sound of thunder and hope. Um, and it got me thinking about what could be done. And I did some conceptual design work and decided that something could actually be built that could be portable and affordable and used by a little league coach. And that led to the design and development of the SkyScan product, which was introduced in 1995. Um, it was really the first practical, self-contained, portable storm detector, and that it actually worked. Um, it was designed really for the youth sports and those kinds of applications. Um, it only had a 40-mile detection range. It actually was only good for about 20 miles. But it was reliable enough to, to serve that purpose. Um, it was my introduction into how fast technology can be made obsolete by the failure of the company running it. Um, by the time the first shipments of SkyScan arrived from China, the SkyScan marketing company had already gone out of business. Um, and so the manufacturer of the product was taken over by the Chinese and it's still made today. You can buy it on the internet, um, which just shows really how, how good a basic design it was for the time. Um, but it got me into weather. I, I had not really thought about it until then. And once I got into it from that experience and started having um, interactions with people that were using the technology, um, but most interestingly, I really got fascinated by thunderstorms. Um, I became a de facto storm chaser because the things I needed to know to design the SkyScan product weren't in textbooks. Um, quite literally. So I, I realized very quickly that what you could get from the library didn't help you if you wanted to build a device that actually would help people. And so I went out and started to teach myself what was actually going on. And that got me into this. Uh, I've been fascinated by it since then. I've been fascinated by, um, you know, the huge disconnect between people's perceptions of things like storms and what Mother Nature is actually doing. Um, so it's been a very interesting journey connecting the physics to to what's really going on to what the average person perceives is going on. And it got me very interested in actually producing technology that could make a difference, that it actually go out in the world and do things like, you know, keeping kids safe on, on little league fields. 
Um, interestingly, as I got deeper into the design, um, the and you get past that kind of an obvious need, protecting the little league field is nice, but I realized that there were really huge needs in in all parts of our society, in schools and in industry, um, that, that really demanded a kind of, of practicality that simply hadn't been done, hadn't been executed. And it hadn't been executed because Mother Nature was, was very subtle as she usually is, and it, it, you, it took a long time to figure out what she was doing and to take that in, information and knowledge and begin to roll it back into products. Um, taking all the things that I'd learned with the SkyScan and have, having gotten fascinated with understanding thunderstorms and being able to, to make them understandable to people, uh, that led me into the design of the Thunderbolt product. Um, the Thunderbolt was introduced in 2003 um, it's probably still the primary handheld storm detection product used around the world because it's the best thing out there. It works. Um, the thing that Thunderbolt did that the SkyScan didn't is that it actually was able to accumulate a small stream of data about a storm and build a model. And instead of, instead of just giving you a light stack that goes off when something happens, it accumulates data, tells you there's, there's a storm out there, plots its relative motion to you and takes that kind of information and turns it into an ETA. It turns it into time warning for people because one of the things that I learned in talking to people that were trying to use storm detection technology, distance didn't really do anything for them. They needed to know how much time they had at a particular spot until that spot was at risk. And so that led me into not only taking the physics of thunderstorms and trying to understand them and make my craft of, of detecting them better, but also providing that interface with people that made that information usable in real time. Ultimately, the name of the game that got me involved is making a difference. Data is data, that's nice, but saving lives, letting people make decisions that make a difference is really what it's all about from my standpoint. Sure, sure. Um, the Nimbus technology really is my third generation design. It's, it's taking the, the 25 years of knowledge that I've accumulated um, and understanding that you really needed a much better mousetrap to, to catch Mother Nature in doing what she was doing. Because I wanted to go beyond just little bits of data coming in and little bits of data going out into a, a really sophisticated device that was seeing things that no one had really seen and tabulated before. Looking at data streams that are constantly coming out of storms, but that nobody's capturing. They're, they're simply not being looked at by any of the, of the existing other technology sources that we use today. Sure. And I think really that's what Nimbus is going to do. It's, it's capturing and being able to access in real time um, a lot of data that simply isn't there in any source that, that you guys are used to looking at. And I believe it's also the way that we're finally going to be able to get a, a handle on doing things like anticipating detecting tornadoes. It, 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 the Nimbus is designed to look at, at what's going on in, in a thunderstorm and capture that complexity and in real time because it's got enough computing power and data collection power behind it. And I think it's going to let us take a really big step forward in, in being able to provide warning about serious things that happen very quickly right now. It happened really too quickly for the existing system to react and pass warning downstream. Sure. Well, it says, and, and I'll, I'll bring this up, Edward, um, just kind of looking off of uh, the website and looking at information about the, the Nimbus uh, device itself. And that's, that's what caught my attention initially. Uh, when I saw some information about the product, really two things. Number one, obviously, I'm a weather geek. Uh, but number two, I'm also a, a tech geek. I like my tech toys. And so this it caught my attention. But but the thing that made me go, you know, we need to dig into this a little bit further. Um, you know, it says the lack of accurate real-time local storm information right now is primarily because the National Weather Radar System is designed to detect much larger weather events covering statewide areas. The signatures of the most dangerous forms of storm activities, such as tornadoes, develop rapidly and on a much smaller scale than what is normally detected on the large 
scale radar systems. And so that, that's what caught my attention. Was I'm like, are you kidding me? There's a device that's going to tell me a tornado's coming? Um, explain, help us out on that. Help explain how, uh, what, what that is. Because I'm like, are you kidding me? What? It's, it's hard enough to tell people there's going to be a tornado in a county uh, let alone if I'm standing in Cincinnati, Ohio with this thing in the air, this thing's going to tell me that. But see, that's the real problem. For instance, down here in Florida from, from today through September, where I'm sitting is under a tornado watch all the time. The, the, the entire state of Florida is, is, is at, at risk for tornadoes. The problem with that kind of warning is it's so broad that after a while nobody pays attention to it because you can't, you can't take – any kind of action with it. I can't do something. Mm-hmm. And so one of, one of my goals is to produce information that's available in real time, but it's also actionable. Not just, hey, there's a bad thing happening over there 10 miles, but I want to be able to tell you sitting in your house on this block, there's a bad thing happening. It's coming at you. It's coming this fast. And based on what is happening, this is the best thing you should do now. And maybe that's leave. Maybe that's go down in your basement. Maybe it's go to the the elementary school down at the end of the block. And if the data was there in real time, people like Google and Amazon are creating the internet. The the connectivity is there. Okay, what we really need is that real-time data that can be pushed into that system that everybody is getting connected to. Everybody on this podcast, everybody in the world right now. Sure. What's, think, what's that data? I guess is my question. What? Yeah. What? What are you pulling? What are you using? That's that's telling the device that the tornado conditions are present, or there's a tornado. I mean, what's the device actually telling the end user? And what's the data? Without obviously telling all your secrets, I understand. But what? What's the data in general that's telling the unit that hey, the conditions are present for that? Right. Well. At the core, what the Nimbus is, is a really, really well-defined and refined and sensitive low-frequency magnetic field detection device. It's able to capture data on multiple channels. The handheld unit has four. Um, There are different iterations of the technology that can add additional channels. Um, One of the things that I learned going way back to the design of the Skyscan product when I was was trying to solve that problem and, and said, okay, what can I build? that can be self-contained and go out in that little league field uh, that can be battery powered and see something that hasn't really been seen before. And in looking at the physics of it, what you want to do is detect magnetic fields for a couple of reasons. Um, if, If you remember your high school and college physics, the magnetic field propagation equation is a little different than the electric field because it's missing a term. It only has two terms as opposed to three. That's, a whole interesting physics question on another level. It's because there's yeah, no. Yeah, you such lost me on that, but that's all right. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it's it, it may lead us into. I think Mother Nature is giving us a hint about some other really big things, but it's because there's no such thing as a magnetic monopole. The electron is is the the particle of of electricity. There's no such thing as a particle of the magnetic field, and it makes the propagation equations different. And what I learned from designing the SkyScan product and the Thunderbolt product, it, it, it gives you access to a lot more information with much less noise. I, I like to say that the, 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 the useful data in magnetic fields comes at a much higher signal-to-noise ratio than if you're looking at electric fields. So is the tornado cre- creating, you know, if I'm your student and I'm a freshman and I'm sitting in your class – your physics class right now, um, a lot of the stuff is going to be shooting over my head. What I want to know is is how what what's the tornado creating then that's telling the device it's near or or the the situation or the possibility right. for a tornado. What, well. what the Nimbus is able to do because of all that data it's getting, it's looking at all those magnetic fields that are constantly fluctuating inside that thunderstorm. A thunderstorm is, a, is an enormous heat engine, right? It, it's a heat engine five miles high, and the convection in that heat engine is creating the charge separation that ultimately comes out as lightning. Before it comes out as lightning, however, 
it, it's producing a lot of other constant magnetic field fluctuation in that storm. The lightning is like the big spark. What I learned 25 years ago and, and that was poorly documented or not documented in the textbooks is that constant magnetic field interplay that goes on in the storm can tell you a great deal about what's going on in that storm if you learn to listen to it. A tornado is a very violent distortion that happens at the very bottom of that thunderstorm. It's an anomaly that occurs in the bottom 2,000 feet of this thing that's, that's 40 or 50,000 feet high. So imagine it this way. You have this, this giant engine that is a very complex magnetic field that changes as, as the currents change, as convection changes. As that thunderstorm is getting ready to give birth to a tornado, it changes its fundamental magnetic field signature. And many of those changes are very fast transients. They happen in a very small area. And, and the fact that a tornado is such a confined event is why it gets lost in, in our national weather system. We're not designed to look for something that small that happens that fast, that changes that quickly. In order to see that, in order to see the signature of that kind of an effect, you've got to be capturing very localized magnetic field changes and be able to tie them to a very small part of that thunderstorm. That's the technology that we're creating. And if you can do that, I believe, not only can I see the tornado as it forms, because it's a very violent change in that, that very localized signature of the storm, but I believe as we have, have time to look at the data the Nimbus is gonna be collecting, and this is where guys like you in the storm chasing world is an important part of what I wanna accomplish because what I need is data collected from 100 places at once. And let's go back and look at the signatures. The Nimbus is literally creating data fields that no one has looked at before. I think we're going to find some really, really interesting things going on in there that help us to begin to anticipate when something like a thunderstorm is beginning to fundamentally change its nature and, and put down a tornado. Well, uh, let, let me get the other team involved with some questions, too. Yeah, yeah, I had, I, had a couple, yeah. I had a couple of quick questions here, if I can go ahead. Um, so speaking of, we mentioned that the device is able to detect that a tornado might be forming or that there could be a tornado. How is it differentiating between tornado and squall line? Because I noticed that there's a couple of different warnings it can give. So what, what kind of data are you ingesting or how does it know that there's a difference between, let's say, a squall line and a, like a supercell tornado? Um, size of the event. In other words, the Nimbus, um, when, we, when we started out with the design specification for the product, I wanted to go out to 300 miles because you needed to see big snapshots to be able to capture things like squall lines and see them physically different in the landscape. Um, we did much better than I thought. The Nimbus actually currently field tests out to 660 miles um, for the handheld unit. Um, the larger units that we intend to offer to the storm chasers, the mobile based version, can probably go out a little farther than that. But the answer is that we can see a big area, we know where something is, and we can define the size of that magnetic field effect against that reality. So the Nimbus knows what it's looking for, and it knows what something, how big something should be in terms of it, if its actual scale in the landscape. Very interesting. In other words, yeah, so in other words, obviously tornadoes most are, are most likely to happen in, in violent squall line situations. So you need a technology that can map that whole giant event that's going on, but also have enough data available to it that it can focus its attention on the parts of that that are changing quickly and potentially most violently. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, that kind of leads into my next question that I was going to have is when you have a squall line, sometimes you have these QLCS kind of brief spin up tornadoes and, but you kind of answered it. It's able to kind of zero in maybe and look at the large scale and say squall line, but then if it's able to get enough data, I guess it would be able to pinpoint maybe the QLC, QLCS tornado within that line, it sounds like. Correct. Um, the, one of the things that we had to put in to do, not only do I need to see um, how far away something is. Every previous technology simply was a distance meter. Um, every single data point that the Nimbus receives also attaches the polarity of the signal to it. So I have bearing on every data point coming in. 
So as the Nimbus is collecting the data, it's able to assign not only distances, but locations to it. So even in a very confusing situation, like a squall line rolling over you, it can still hunt out the very specific areas where it's seeing the violent weather occurring based on, on the magnetic field changes. So my question is, um, how is this any different, no offense, how is this any different from the National Weather Service warnings that get sent out when they look at velocity data on radar and they pinpoint where a tornado is occurring? Well, because the velocity data on radar is simply looking at at velocity vectors in the water vapor and the clouds, right? It's not looking at magnetic fields. Very often these things overlap, very often they don't. Um, one of the interesting things that I learned in watching storms these last 25 years is that Mother Nature doesn't always make those two events coincide so they're easy to see. In fact, often they don't um, because water vapor and the magnetic fields, especially in a large complicated system, aren't don't often coincide with that level of precision. So again, that's why the watches are given over large areas and the National Weather Service has to rely on you guys to actually go see something. That's the problem. That's the real inherent problem in the system that I've, I've been watching for the last 20 years. And I, I think the Nimbus may be one, one solution to that, at least a practical one, not perfect. There is no perfect solution because mother nature is really complex, but I think the Nimbus has the ability to, to give us much better data in a much larger percentage of those incidents than having to rely on water vapor velocity vectors. So can, can this device actually tell if a tornado is actually on the ground, like a confirmed tornado? Can it do that? Is that what you're saying? I think we can. The current product can't. I believe that the data is in there to let us do that because the magnetic fields of the storms are going to change. Um, it's probably going to take us a little while to sift through the data and, and be able to be precise about that. What the Nimbus 4 handheld, this guy that, that's being released now, um, is able to look at the pre-tornado conditions. It's able to isolate the really violent parts of the storm, both in terms of lightning frequency. Um, it can watch for the polarity shift in the lightning from positive to negative, look at the shift in, in, the, um, in the ratio. And that ratio shift occurs because it's being driven by the change in the overall magnetic field structure of the storm. That's why that's happening. It's not an accident. It's tied to that. Um, what the Nimbus 4 can do is, is isolate, that, isolate that occurrence to a very small space. So if we know the, the half square mile where that's happening, not just that it is happening, but it's happening in that half square mile over there, that's a really dangerous place to be. So Edward, real quick, uh, Brady here. So um, what if, I know like often you can have uh, situations where you have a supercell um, where you can also have a squall line in, you know, a 300 mile radius. What happens if both of those are present? Um, does it um, pick and choose one to put, um, to label, you know, say there's a supercell, there's a tornado near or a squall line, or, you know, how does it differentiate between the two? Well, remember, a, a squall line and, and a supercell are huge events compared to a tornado. A tornado is a small, it, literally, it's going to be a small pin that you stick in that landscape. So what the Nimbus is going to tell you is I'm seeing squall lines. I'm seeing this part of the squall line might be a supercell. Um, it's still always going to be looking at that one small area where the data says right here it's very violent. So it, it's not like it. The squall line is just a really big adjective that describes a really big data field that's going on. The Nimbus doesn't care. That's really the strength of it, and that's what that's why that we haven't seen a product that's able to do this. You know, one of the things you need to do is you have to have access to all that data in real time and immediately be able to sift through to the part that's most interesting and, and most important. Okay. So if you are, if you're doing storm chasing and you're in a suburb of Oklahoma, okay, there's a squall line out there. You really don't care what's happening 250 miles away on the squall line, right? Yeah, exactly. But you, 
What you care about is the data that applies to the two square miles around you. Okay. And, and I think that's the so, this platform has the ability to do that. So Edward, uh, Maz here. <clears throat> First of all, I'm going to pull on 20 years of all my physics and try and use the term that best describes this. Uh, it's cool. It's very cool. Absolutely. So I just want to say, I, I want to say, I can, first of all, there's two questions. One is, so what's the cost? And and the reason I say that is, is I can, I mean, after having been on the air for 20 years, every TV station's looking for a competitive edge. Here's a potential, another tool. See, you know, them, um, developing a tech team inside there or some of their reporters where literally you can get a lot of people out in the field with these devices and really narrow things down and help the meteorologist as well as, as the weather service. And then my second question is uh, what's your stock symbol? We're a privately held company, but I'm sure my, my CEO can, can get back to you with some kind of a, of an investment option. Um, that's not my department. I just make the stuff and, <laughs> And, and other smarter people decided what to charge for it. Although I, I will say this, this guy right here, um, the basic handheld um, in non-directional form, I think is going to have a MSRP of around 800. And if you talk to, um, we have some really good deals we put in place to try to get this technology in mass in the hands of storm chaser groups as quickly as we can. Um, so pass the word. Andy Trosper has a whole lot of special packages we're working on because you know, I want the stuff out there because I want the data back. Um, one of the really clever things we did, I don't know if you can see well enough, on the on the back of, of our guy here, two USB ports, two. Um, the idea is very quickly that all these things are linkable in real time via the Internet. So the data field we're creating is incredibly rich at any location, and I think very quickly – we're going to have the ability to mesh all that data, and we're going to see a whole other level of, of understanding come out of it. I mean, the real problem, and you guys know this, I think, better than anything, the thing that I, I was amazed at beginning back in the early 90s when I was, I was trying to sift through the data to build something like a Skyscan, which, you know, today really is a high school project toy. There just wasn't any data there. All the data is disjointed. And, and somebody has data about a, a storm they watched in Florida, you know, 30 years ago. What, what, what I was amazed at was there'd be these little data pools that somebody went out and, and cataloged one event. And then because they were accessible for eight years afterward, that little event was the basis of all the work that was done. And, and it made it a very limited, narrow, myopic view of what was going on. And so I, I think we are... I think the Nimbus can help there be a real change in that landscape. You know, we, we're about to have a flood of data that no one's looked at before. And I'm sure there's stuff in there that I haven't thought about. I'm really hoping there is, that there's real potential here for us to learn a lot just because we're seeing these thunderstorms in a way that they haven't been seen before. We're seeing them through a different filter. Follow-up question. Um, is it going to have Siri's voice or yours? Um, it definitely won't have my voice. And I, again, I will, <laughs> I, I think my voice was voted down by all the people in it. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, I a talking version would be nice. Yes. I, I think one of the, one of the challenges we, we, we are trying to put into the user interface and we're still doing it now. And again, part of the reason that I want to get feedback from from you guys is, you know, I'm a physicist and we have to fine tune what the product says to people in different situations. You know, it, the, when things happen fast, it isn't pure data anymore. It's trying to be useful and helpful and, and, and save lives and make things more efficient. One of the, one of the odd things that I learned in all my years of talking to customers is you know, while a lot of my products are out there, and they really do save lives every day. And that's a really cool thing. The vast majority of my products are used by people that are saving money. They're making decisions more efficiently or not making decisions that don't need to be made. Um, one, of the, 
one of the main design features that that comes from our data field being so rich is that the Nimbus is immune to false triggering. Um, it's it, even in a, a very complex electron, electronic environment, um, the signals from lightning look totally different um, from anything else, from cell phones, from computers. Um, one of the odd things is when I designed even the Thunderbolt product, cell phones really weren't prevalent in the landscape. Well, they are today, and they're incredibly noisy devices. Um, so false positives were something that it had to be eliminated completely if the technology was going to be relied on in the kind of applications that I was targeting. And the Nimbus is able to do that because it's seeing so much data all the time. It, it really is impossible to fool. Cool. We're, um, that's, that's uh, unbelievable. We're uh, uh, pretty excited about this, actually. I, I, I really am. Mm -hmm. So, Edward, can you, uh, you know, I was talking with um, your CEO, Tammy Fitzpatrick, uh, earlier. Just, uh, can you briefly explain a little bit the Indiegogo project you guys have uh, coming up or going on? Um, yeah, my understanding, and it's pretty cool, actually, it's, uh, it's a way to basically pre-launch pre products. Um, you get first adopters a chance to, to buy something at a lower price. It gives you exposure you know, into that technology world. Um, clearly, we are, you know, we're not just a weather product. We're potentially many things, and so we're trying to get ourselves awareness uh, in that landscape above and beyond just weather. Um, it, you know, looking down the road um, to both tornado detection and tornado warning. Uh, again, one of my personal goals for the technology is that, that it's really good enough and in a form that we can integrate it into to this entire Internet of Things that's being formed around us. You know, I think it's the first real weather data platform that has that much power. And because it's real time and because it's so specific and localized, I think it really can be incorporated into that infrastructure that's being built. And the Indiegogo is, is a good window into that world and, and, and that evolving technology. Good. Well, we're, we're going to post, uh, we'll have on our website, stormfrontfreaks.com. Uh, we'll post some uh, links to uh, the Nimbus website and everything else. Um, you know, we appreciate it. This is some great tech. Uh, looking forward to kind of seeing what that can do to obviously help the the weather community. So appreciate you uh, coming on, Edward, but we're not going to let you leave quite yet. Uh, we have let me add one, uh, I add one thing yeah, Phil, before yeah. you go, because I, I really do want to send a message and you guys can get it to the storm chaser world. Um, we, we, we have already designed uh, a version of the Nimbus we call the mobile base and, and our first adopter group was specifically storm chasers. Um, it has capabilities above and beyond just a handheld unit. It was thought about as being something that was going to be, you know, move through the landscape with people that were chasing storms. Um, one of the things that I, I can build into it, let me show you. I have this show and tell here. Um, I know I've exceeded my time limit, but you guys can edit this all out if you need to. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I'm, I want to show you the antennas that the, the Nimbus 4 is called a 4 because it's got four channels in it working simultaneously. Um, this is the, the core for one of the antennas. Are you, am I seeing that? No, but we are an audio podcast, so keep that in mind as well. You might have to uh, verbally okay. explain what you're showing. Um, I'm trying to get if I can get these up so you can see. I've got two field test units here, and at the top of them are the antenna arrays. Are those coming across? Sure. Yep. Yep. Okay. This is the state, one, one on this side. These are the guys that are normally in a Nimbus 4. Next to them, I'm putting the antennas that we're going to put into the mobile bases for the storm chase. You see the difference in the size? They're just, they're ones more, ones also diagonal, correct? So you've got one that's kind of uh, parallel. And well, does this it only have one? This have two, yeah. I'm just looking at the size okay. of the fours. Yeah. I got it, yeah. Um, when you're doing low frequency magnetic field detection, the size of the antenna is really important. The bigger the antenna, the bigger much higher is better, the... Edward. We all know that, right? Oh, yeah. Well, women don't episode. say it, but size yeah. does matter, yes. Yes. It really <laughs> matters when you're doing magnetic field detection. So one of the things that we want is to build it in the... one of the things <laughs> we want to build into the platform for the storm chasers in that mobile base 
are bigger antennas that will give us much higher resolution, um, much lower, um, the ability to see much faster, smaller transients, and the ability to plot them with, with much greater accuracy. And so one of the dialogues I want to open up with is with storm chaser groups because they're going to be the first source of the, of the real data that we have to look at. And the faster they're involved, the faster I think we can really get tornado detection, a tornado detection system in place in this country that, that makes a difference for everyone. That sounds good. So what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll make sure I uh, work with you guys, uh, find out the best way for them to maybe contact you. Um, and we, again, we'll get that on our website, stormfrontfreaks.com, and, and so that we can try and facilitate that uh, for you guys. Sound Thanks. good? Much appreciated. All right. So we're going to jump into our lightning round. Uh, so, so part of, you know, we want to have fun doing this. So we just got, we just got done talking a bunch of science and physics and uh, all kinds of good stuff. Edward, you did a great job of dumbing it down for people like me. So I appreciate it. Uh, but we're going to have some fun now. We're going to do what we call the lightning round. This is going to be a two, two minute speed round of, of questions for our guests. And what we're going to focus on uh, today is we're actually going to honor the movie Twister uh, a lot of people know we just celebrated its 20th anniversary uh, just a couple weeks ago. So I've, I'm going to just rattle off in the next two minutes uh, some Twister questions. Uh, Edward, give me an answer. If you don't know, just say, I don't know. And I'm sure uh, the team, you guys can chime in with the answer. Sound good? Sounds All right, good. here we is there, go. Is there a prize here, Phil? What's the prize on the? You didn't say the prize. It's, it's called Pride. Pride, okay. That's the prize. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> okay. All right, so question one. Ready, go. Uh, what actress played the role of Joe? Helen Hunt. What food in Aunt Meg's breakfast was described as practically its own food group? Ooh, I got to pass on that one. Gravy. Yes. Number three, what was the real reason Bill went to see Joe at the beginning of the movie? I don't think she was pregnant, was she? No. <laughs> not, not, that, not that any of us moviegoers were aware of, no. Signed divorce papers. Good. What animal was seen oh flying in the water spout? A cow. What movie is playing at the drive-in theater when the tornado hits? <laughs> Here's Johnny. The Shining. What is the name of Bill and Joe's tornado recording contraption? Anybody? Dorothy. Dorothy, Dorothy, yes. What what is the name of Jonas's tornado recording contraption? Anybody? (laughs) No idea. Dot three. What was Bill's nickname by the team as told in the story around Meg's table? The extreme. The extreme. In an oh, this is a good one. In an era of the film crew, even though the movie is set in Oklahoma, Pax, what is the sign on the road signs? Anybody? It's Texas. Mm. True or false? Last question. <laughs> Twister was the first movie ever released on DVD. True or false? What, what's oh, your guess, Edward? I'm gonna guess. I'm gonna guess true. You are correct. Whoa! That, is true. Yeah. that is little yeah, horrible. I had to look this up. I wouldn't have known that either. But it was actually uh, the first movie out on DVD, and lo and behold, it was the last movie out on high definition DVD before Blu-ray took over. Uh, it was the old VHS Betamax. Uh, competition so i was keeping a score i think because of the cow answer i win the car you did you did good you got pride <laughs> you, you got pride you spent pride. all the money on the bus uh but edward hey we appreciate you joining us and, and my obviously pleasure a good sport and sharing um and certainly you're welcome to uh to stick around as we get into some other discussions as well but uh definitely appreciate you having on board uh we're going to take a quick break and when we come back uh, we've actually got answers to solving the storm chaser congestion 
uh, out in the Midwest. We got all the answers on how to fix that. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to introduce Storm School with Brady Harris. Uh, each episode, what uh, Brady's going to pick an often confusing weather topic to teach on. Uh, and I know today he's in the kitchen as he's cooking up some storm ingredients. <laughs> 